Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today, we have a very special episode for you. A compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most entitled parents you've ever heard. If you cannot stand Karens, please let me know by smashing that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And huge shout out to our newest official channel members, Steph Barnes and Spearfisher85. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Become a channel member today and I'll give you a shout out in a video very soon. R slash Entitled Parents. Our first story we'll be reading today. Project partners tried to screw me over, but I got a lot of money instead. After that, use my friendship to steal from me? Get ready to pay me back in full and move by user Dragonfire9000. And after that, this is a home, not a prison. Yet. By user Delicious Malediction. And then we'll be finishing up with Make My Life a Nightmare and Hack My Email? Enjoy Being Expelled. By user Draco Foxgal. Project partners tried to screw me over, but I got a lot of money instead. Hey Reddit, this is the only revenge story I have, and the best thing is I laid the groundwork in advance. It's a bit long perhaps, and written on mobile, but it makes me happy every time I think of it. A couple of years ago, when I was 18, I got my degree in game development. It's a four-year track, with the last year being four months internship and four months to work on a test of skill. This is a project that you can think up yourself to prove that you're capable in game development. I had my internship at a very small game studio, which was just two women, let's call them B and C. They both specialized in 3D model making and 2D art, textures, graphics, that sort of stuff. Neither of them was a programmer, so they got interns to program stuff for them. I was kind of disappointed, as I had no experienced programmer to learn from or to guide me. But this was my only option, since I started looking for an internship too late. B and C were kind of abusive and condescending in their language use. I didn't stand up for myself much. I was always a fat nerd and had no self-confidence coming out of high school or college. What was cool is that they were located in an incubator, which is like a large office building that rents desks for 50 euro a month instead of floors. Great for startups and single person companies. As a cherry on top, it was also an incubator that specialized in game companies so, lots of contacts and opportunities to meet people in the industry. I had fun there, at first. They already started on a project, and I asked them what system they wanted me to make, like inventory, menus, or gameplay elements. They had an idea of what they wanted. It was a game for kids that used augmented reality. AR is quite difficult to make, and they didn't want to use APIs from companies that had already made the AR system because that would cost too much money. So for three out of the four months, I was there to build my own AR system. It was really tough, and I had no help, other than Stack Overflow, because the other developers there had their own stuff to work on. The best way to learn programming is to be good with Google, and just jump in the deep end and figure it all out. After, I finished the AR system that worked with 2D image recognition, perfect for what they wanted. But it turned out they didn't have a game design document, which is a plan of sorts of the stuff you want in your game. They also didn't have a to-do wall or anything, so I spent my last month making inventory systems and stuff that was always not the way they wanted after all. They just said we need an inventory system, but didn't know what it all had to do. So basically, my time was wasted there. Skip four to five months. I got my degree and decided I wanted to check out the industry some more. I got all my savings out and decided I could spend a year making games and maybe it would lead to something. So I rented a desk at the incubator and thought about what game I was going to make. B and C believed that if you are technical, you're not creative. They saw programmers like tools used to achieve their vision. Two things annoying about that. 1. Just because I like programming doesn't mean I'm incapable of imagining worlds and stories. 2. Game developers and game designers need each other two disciplines of equal importance that make a game work. So, this is what happened when they approached me. 
Hey, OP, are you busy? I'm just thinking what kind of game I want to make. See, si, come over, he's not busy. Hi, OP, could you help us out with something? Uh, yeah, sure. What can I do for you? We need you to make a menu for Unity. The engine I was working on. For the AR system you made. Now I'll admit, the AR system was not the easiest to work with. It had a lot of settings and a series of steps needed to make it work with an image. And they wanted me to simplify it, even though I had made an extensive manual on how to make it work. But I learned so much in those eight months and was positive I could improve the system a lot. Which was good, because the current code belonged to them. But I could use the same architecture of code and rework it to make it mine. Yeah, alright. I guess I can rework the system and make it more user-friendly. Nice. Let us know when you're finished. I spent about a month making my AR system better, and the finished system shared only around 10% code with the old system. When I told them I was finished and showed it off. This 2.0 version had better tracking in all light conditions. It can cover more angles, needs less detail, and now has a very user-friendly UI along with tooltips. What I also did is change the standard script Unity gives you when you make a new script. I put my name and copyright in the code so I could prove it was mine. B and C were very happy with it and even asked me to join their project as a partner. Yeah, I would love to join. I'll even give you a discount on the AR system. C, with a kind of smug face. Yeah, we won't be paying you. The code was already ours and you just improved it. Besides, we didn't sign a contract or anything. Just be happy with the opportunity we just gave you. And if you didn't intern with us, you wouldn't be here to begin with. Are you serious? I spent a month working on this. Yeah, but you'll make plenty with the project. There was nothing I could do about it, so I just sucked it up and agreed to join the project. Maybe I agreed more out of fear of missing out rather than excitement to work with them. I did learn a lesson though. Always have a contract. And boy, did I draw something up. For the contract, I had a right to 25% of the finished product's income, basic stuff. But because I didn't trust BNC, was determined not to be burned again, I drew up a general conditions contract, which is basically the policy and restrictions of working with my one-man studio. It has all the basic rights and stuff. But it also had two clauses that make me laugh to this day. One, any and all code developed by me belonged to me in perpetuity and may not be copied modified or used in any way without my expressed permission, and under no condition can I be forced to release the code files. Fine on breach was 1,000 euros per script file. Fine on breach was 1,000 euros per script file. The AR system had more than 20 scripts in it. 2. When I get fired for a shared project, I am entitled to 50 euros an hour I spent working on the project. No exceptions. They signed both contracts without even reading them and didn't have a contract for me in return. The first contract was what bound me to the project. And here comes the good part. I learned pretty early on that I was just there to listen and make whatever they wanted. They did not want my input on anything. Even if they had dumb, impractical, or just impossible ideas about what the game should have, I could not protest or suggest something else, even though I tried. Fast forward six months. It's winter now, and the project is just not going very well. I constantly have to revisit finished components because they wanted more functionality in them. I was not happy and went over to their desks to complain and demand a final document I could work off of. It's called feature creep, and a real game developer should know how to deal with that. It's not alright. I am wasting my time because you two can't make up your minds and get a final idea in your heads. B and C dismissed me and later sent me an email. Dearest OP, we regret to inform you that our partnership is not working out and we have decided to let you go from the project. We hope there aren't any hard feelings. I was quite angry, but I remembered the clauses, so at least I would get paid a lot of money. I went over to their desks with the meanest grin on my face. Hey guys, I read your email. That sucks, but I understand. We have different creative ideas and we're just not on the same page. We're so happy you understand. Are you sure there are no hard feelings? No, not at all. I learned a lot and had fun. I can recycle the components to make other games. 
Just remember, you can't do anything similar to our game. They referred to the competition clause in my internship contract, which I apparently was still under because that project wasn't finished. Oh yeah, no worries. I got something else in mind. After which I returned to my desk and send them an invoice of 26 weeks, 40 hours a week, worth 50 euros an hour on the project with my log to back it up. The cost? 52,000 euros, around 60,000 US dollars at the time. They freaked out. They had nowhere near this kind of money, as they were both working second jobs and were both saving up, wanting to start a family with their boyfriends. There is no way we're paying this much. We understand some compensation is warranted, but this is too much. I lost six months of income on this project, and you signed these terms. I had a copy of the general conditions and pointed the clause out to them. But fine, I'll take it to court and we'll see what the judge has to say. The court proceedings took around eight months. I had decided in the meantime that owning a one-man game studio was really hard and decided to go to university to get a degree in IT and do game development on the side. But that's another story. The judge had decided I was in the right, thanks to my logs and copyright lines in the code, but also asking for too much as it would utterly bankrupt BNC. So I would get 20,000 euro and be reimbursed for legal costs, totaling around 35,000. For BNC, it was a massive blow. B had to sell her car to get the money and couldn't get a mortgage for the house she wanted to buy. They also had to use home offices, as the others working at the incubator wouldn't even talk with them anymore, since I made sure everyone there knew what happened, how they tried to screw me over. I also told the entire story to my old teachers, and no interns will be coming to them from my old college. The last I heard from them was a year or so later, asking me for the code I made for the project. A drive crapped out and they didn't have backups. This shows their level of professionalism. I laughed over the phone and pointed them to the 1. Clause of the General Conditions. You can't claim the code. It's in the General Conditions. You can't even be working with anything I made because you don't have my permission to use my code. If you did, you owe me another 20,000 euro. Tell you what though, I'll sell it to you. Well, how much do you want? 52,000. A silence on the other side of the phone. Click. As of now, their studio is out of business and I am to graduate next year with no study debt at all. I lost weight and have a lot more self-confidence. This story makes me feel powerful and good about myself. I stood up and it got rewarded. Don't mess with the fat programming nerd. Next up we've got, use my friendship to steal from me? Get ready to pay me back in full and more. Okay, so this is going to be a long way back but I was encouraged to put this up. Back in my years at high school, PS1 and PS2 era, I lived with my grandmother because it was closer to my school than my mother's, who at the time was self-employed and now is a successful SEO developer. I was not popular in school, but had a closely knit group of friends on my home street. Myself included was 10 kids on our street, six of which were pairs of siblings across seven houses. We all played games, we all completed games, but the amount of games we could get was different. Being the kid with the most, I offered that if anyone wanted to go on a game at my house, I would let them. Now, I have OCD, among other things, thanks to a mental disorder. That meant I used Excel to record what games I owned and if they were bought brand new, the price they were bought at, and I had dealt with people misusing my friendship in school, not high school, to steal from me and my grandma coming in to save the day. But my main hobby is games, so when I started going to high school, I started pin marking the inside of game covers, the white side of the cover that no one sees, doesn't affect resale value. I would also jot the mark down in a notebook with a reference to the game name, again if it was new, pre-owned, or if I had traded it in. I would on occasion lend a game with the express direction that if you borrow it for more than two weeks, I would hound you for it back. People rarely borrowed from me since what they wanted to go on, they could do so at my house. Around the age of 14, games started going missing. Losing one was not new to me, but the frequency of games that went missing had increased. So I set a test. I bought a second notebook and wrote down where each game should have been, editing it if I moved it. Sure enough, 
my copy of Final Fantasy X in my PC draw wound up lost. It was then I realized the worst. One of my friends was stealing from me. I knew if I asked anyone on my street about it, whoever was doing it would stop and I would most likely never catch them. Fortunately, the ball was not rolling on certain things. While GameFAQs was a thing, it wasn't big enough a thing in my neck of the woods for anyone other than me to be using it and I kept it that way by helping anyone on my street with information. Bear in mind, as well, the internet was not so readily used as it is now and a PC did not mean internet access. A PC was just a workstation for schoolwork and PC games bought at the store. If you had internet, it either came with dial-up and was used by one person in the house or you used the Sky Internet keyboard to search using your set-top box. Secondly, and more importantly, it was a 15-minute ride to town and a two-hour drive to the nearest city. The difference? Town did not have a game station. The two places that sold and traded games in town had one policy. The game must come with a box, the disc and the manual. I spent an hour removing every manual I had from the games and storing them in a box under the bottom shelf of my set of drawers. If someone was stealing from me, they wouldn't be profiting off me anymore. I would glean information from outside sources. The three sets of siblings on my street were innocent. Group 1, I will refer to as sisters. Their mother came and helped myself and my grandma clean my great-grandmother's house on Saturdays. I would ask about what they're playing on. If a game that went missing came up, I would ask, Oh, when did they start on that? For two reasons. One, their mother was kind and I didn't want to upset her. Two, to avoid showing suspicion. However, it was responded with, I bought it for them. Or, they bought it when we were in town. So, innocent. The second pair, referred to as twinnies, bought whatever they wanted for within reason from their parents. So, there was no doubt they were innocent. The third, brothers. The younger couldn't keep a secret, and I was very good friends with, helped him in schoolwork, made up the difference if he couldn't quite afford a drink or a chocolate bar, made sure I was an ear for him to talk to, because I didn't trust the other brother beyond friendship. If the older brother was playing anything that was missing, I would know, and how. Again, innocent. That left three boys on my street of varying age, who I only know on a one-to-one -one basis. If I had suspects, it would be them. Over two years of maintaining the facade that I was blissfully unaware, I kept the helpful nature up enough that no one ever questioned my gaming source, Game Facts. Sure enough, games kept going missing, but I was looking for something. No manuals, no trade-ins, no extra cash towards the latest games. I had actually been waiting for one of the games to go missing that people had seen me play and wanted to play. Vex a game similar to Mario 64, but replaced stars with hearts. One of the hearts had copy protection on it that the answer was in the manual, a common practice before it became useless on the internet. Sure enough, a month after finishing, it went missing. A week later, a boy my age I will refer to as Thieving Crap asked me how to open the chest in the whale. Oh, it's in the manual. Thief replied that he had no manual and that it was bought at a car boot sale. In my mind, I had got him. His parents didn't go far, so no city trips or rare city trips, and there had been no car boot sales nearby in the last four months. I made my play. Thief went to karate practice on Tuesdays between 7 and 9. I waited till 7.10 p.m. and went to his house with my grandma with my notebooks, printouts of my records on game purchases, and a document. I will get to that in a moment. After a brief talk of disbelief, I asked if I could prove if their son was stealing, thinking I wouldn't find anything. They let me. I walk over to the copy of Vex that sat in the front room, showed them the inside with no manual, showed them my notebook, and lifted the cover out of the game box, showing a signed pen mark I had used next to the notebook with the same pen mark on the inside cover. While they were stunned, I took this opportunity to pick up a second and third pointed the pin mark in the game, and then moved to the label accordingly to show an identical copy. The mother went white. I asked if I could go see if more were in the house. Shocked, the father complied, and after 20 minutes, I had over 30 games on the table in front of them, all missing booklets. 
all with pin marks on the reverse of the label that matched the inside of the notebooks. But the best bit, upstairs on his PC desk was a note detailing who had what. When I showed them the note, you could see the rage building in the father's eyes. While my grandma talked to the mother about what could happen next, legal ramifications of thief, how he was now 16 and could be tried as an adult with the right judge, I showed the father where I found the note and he found folders of records of games owned by others and when he had acquired them and how much he had traded them in for. Yes, it wasn't just me. He had been stealing games as far back as the Mega Drive era, playing on them till he was done and then trading them in as his own to pocket the cash. He had only started with me since a few years back. My grandma had allowed me to move consoles downstairs for friends to go on, on the condition that it was only when I had friends around and only one console at a time with only the game we were going on to avoid making a mess. Going downstairs, I laid out the document I had saved till now. It was a document that myself, my grandmother, and my mother had laid out, detailed that I would not take the evidence I had to the police on the condition that every game wrongfully taken was returned to me or the original owner. If in the event it could not be, then the full price of the game, when I bought it, would be returned to my grandmother within six months' time, so it could be returned to the rightful owners in one form or another. I had to thank my mother here for the thought of wording it so that in the event I wasn't the only victim, all would have justice. So, thanks, Mom. Both parents signed it. I signed it and my grandma signed it. And the four of us waited at that time. We talked over how we could handle this, agreeing that I would take the folders home and do the research on the retail price on any missing game. When Thief returned, the look on his face was priceless as he stared at the folders and piles of games. In the time I had called my granddad to help us carry the games and notes down the street back home. Before leaving, we informed Thief what would happen, much to his dismay. His house is four doors down and across the small one-exit street, as the other end is a garden and a modern train line, 2000s, that runs through the town. From 9 till 10, I could hear the father yelling at Thief, even when the 915 train went past while I was going through the records of my PC, scanning them on a very basic scanner by today's standards. It felt great and I found it soothing as I combed through. That weekend, I printed off several copies of the agreement and documents listing what had been stolen from each of my friends or a pair of siblings, how much they were worth and when to expect the money. I returned the folders and gave the parents a copy of the agreement with a value of how much he had stolen from all parties and could not return. They told me they would pay and it would come out of Thief's savings and allowance for the next four years. Both me and him were 16 at the time. He would be in his first year of university before he paid his parents back. Unsurprisingly, the karate trips stopped. Once they had closed the door, I pulled several envelopes out of my bag and made the rounds of my streets. Every kid got one of these envelopes that held the information relevant to them and a copy of the agreement. To my surprise, it took two weeks for every penny to be given to my grandma. Using the records, I gave each of my friends exactly what they were owed in an envelope to avoid prying eyes. Once that was done, I waited till the following Monday and handed a copy of the agreement to my school. Like most schools, mine had a system so that duties would be delegated to the most trustworthy, well-behaved of the students that both me and Thief were on. Thief was removed from that list and the staff knew he was a thief. On my street, he was removed from the circle of friends. We wouldn't talk to him. He wasn't welcome at street events. Most certainly not any trips. In school, he was not allowed on the remaining few school trips because his father wouldn't sign permission slips. After that, I didn't change. Sure, we were one friend down, but none of my games went missing again. At 18, I moved because of college to my mom's, but I had only used up the money returned to me by then on a 360. My mom keeps a framed copy of the signed agreement in the office and I keep the original framed in my office to this day to remind me. Unsurprisingly, after finishing high school, he and his parents moved away, as it was quite clear that the kids and parents alike wanted nothing to do with him. Next up we've got, this is a home, not a prison, yet. Greetings all. Well, Mother's Day has come and gone once again. Children of all types have spent the day annoying their mothers enough that she is pleased to see them either leave or go back to their old routines and just leave her to peace. 
Ah. Now, I am not a mother myself, but if you have read my first ever post on Reddit, then you all have at least heard of my mother. If not, then let me tell you a tale. One of bratty kids, an overworked mother, and her revenge. Sit back, relax, because my mother can break your back. This is entirely true. She's a chiropractor. She actually learned how to break someone's neck and how to know the signs just in case she ever comes close to actually doing it. Which, okay, well, scary. But she learned it in a university setting on cadavers, so all good. Let's take a look back, way back, to the time of the first stirrings of the Y2K bug, where people believed the world was going to end because the computers were going to hit 00 when the year 2000 came around. It was almost the summer of 1999. I was just a twig of a child, mostly gangly limbs and big eyes, and all of 11 years old or so. Our cast for this tale is A, my eldest step-sibling, N, the catalyst of the tale, me, the Bambi-looking gullible kid who should have just known better, Lou, my stepbrother, my age, and he should have known better too, and K, younger sister by two years, and L, youngest, the baby of the family. Now my mother remarried a man we shall call RJ when I was about eight years old. Due to the whole soap incident, he delegated all forms of discipline to her when it came to punishing us on a whole. So, due to her working long 13-hour days to support us all and the lack of allowance for doing chores because, let's face it, six kids tends to run you dry if you try to keep up with it all. We, the children, started slacking off. This did not sit well with my mother, who used her usual threat of, I will go into your rooms, and whatever is on the floor goes in the garbage. This is something we had heard all our lives, but us younger kids, as in me and all below me, totally believed she would do it. Until this one faithful day. It was gorgeous outside. The sun was shining, spring had brought new leaves to the trees, and all neighborhood kids could be heard screaming through the streets because the 90s were a time of uncontrolled childhood chaos where parents happily released their spores into the wild and drank wine while they didn't have to think about their hellspawn until the street lights flicked on. Unfortunately for us, my mother decided that this gorgeous weekend day was best used for picking up the slack that we let get away from us. She demanded we clean our rooms while repeating that well-known phrase we all knew and despised. We groaned, we whined, we relented and started to comply. But then my sister, N, the stone-cold and wisest of the elder sisters, just shrugged and ignored the order. Her and A shared a room, practically having one side of the upper floor, which had a wall knocked down and renovated into almost like a mini apartment sans kitchen, all to themselves. And at the all-knowing age of 13, N, and 15, A, they both decided they had better things to do that day than listen to our mom. A left to go on a date with her boyfriend she made the year before and N sat in her room on her computer, a giant PC of a thing linked into a separate line so the dial-up wouldn't mess up our phone systems. When we, the younger kids, started bugging her, shocked at her audacity, my sister N said these words. It's not like she's actually going to throw all our stuff away. She paid for it all. She's not just going to toss it all out because that's a waste of money. This is a home. It's not a prison. She's not the warden and we don't have to do what she says. Then she left us standing there with our puny impressionable minds totally blown. We didn't have to do what mom said. Is that even possible? My younger sister Kay and my brother Lou took this at face value and immediately took off. They were 11, Lou, and 9, Kay and had friends waiting on them. They didn't have time to waste cleaning their rooms on an empty thread. L, only seven years old, was more hesitant but was as easily distracted as I was and we ended up playing Barbies for the rest of the day, totally forgetting our worries until dinner time. Silence. Dinner was quiet, awkward. Mom was upset the house did not get cleaned and RG was ready to lay his hammer down at my mother's command. The interrogation went as expected, and Kay, our more, mm, expressive sister, who had a bit of a wrath from the Ninja Turtles type personality, blew up, figuratively, at my mother. This is a home, mom, not a prison, and it's my room. With this, dinner was concluded. Kay stormed off, 
Mom went quiet and with the most Stepford wife smile ever, just asked us all if we felt this way. My elder sisters agreed immediately, not really caring because of teenage angst, and we younger kids slowly nodded at their insistent stares. I see. And that was that. No punishments, no scoldings or groundings, and the rest of the weekend went off without a hiccup. We should have known something was up. Mom sent us all off to school Monday herself, which was unusual because she usually woke before us and was gone by the time we finished brushing our teeth. We then wouldn't see her until dinner later in the day, but she made us a big breakfast, hinted at a surprise for us when we got home from school, kissed us goodbye, and sent us happily out the door. Now, I am sure you are all thinking that I should get on with it. What was the revenge and how does it fit into Pro? Well, I'll tell you. Mom's Revenge While we were at school, Mom, RG, and some of his friends came in and got rid of everything that would be enjoyable to a child. The basement was emptied and cleaned. All computers, video games, Game Boys, CD players, rodeos, and TVs were taken. Dressers and closets were emptied. Toys upon toys were tossed. Colorful blankets and sheets removed from beds. Decorations, pencils, and coloring tools. Papers and scissors, glue, basically any and all craft supplies, gone. When we returned home, Archie was in his military uniform and accosted us as we came in through the front door, pinned us to the wall, and frisked each of us. Backpacks, candy, everything we had on us was taken. My mother then handed us some gray pajamas and ordered us to march into the bathroom to change. Terrified, we complied. The living room seemed so bare. The piano and recorder was gone, along with the TV. The puzzles and games usually kept in the room gone from the shelves. The bathroom was no better, bare of except head and shoulders and a bar of soap on a string for some reason that smelled strongly of bleach. We were then set down on lawn chairs, the couch occupied by my stone-cold mother, as we waited for every child to arrive in silence. Welcome to the month of hell. We watched as my mother tossed all our clothes into a garbage bag. All toys and art supplies from our backpacks followed, and RG was in uniform with his scariest expression as my mother went through our new itinerary for life from now on. Wake up at dawn. PT in the mornings through the town led by RG. Oatmeal, no sugar for breakfast, then off to school. Drop off made to the classrooms by RG and pick up the moment the bell goes off at the end of the day. Lunch is roast beef sandwiches, barely any mayo and wilted lettuce. School has been informed to not give us anything else and to take away anything not given to us by our parents. Once home, we are each assigned a room to clean, our bags taken and checked for contraband. Room clean? PT on the backyard, a deflated soccer ball as a toy, nothing else. Leave the fenced-in area and you get extra punishment. No friends, calls, or escape. Dinner was cold peas, corn, beans, and mystery meat. No butter, salt, or ketchup allowed. You don't take care of your home, so you don't deserve your home. Welcome to prison. Homework was done at the table. Use of pencils and paper regulated and inventory counted. Bedtime was at 6. Lights out at 7 and the doors locked until morning. Bathroom must be used before bed or you have to go in the pot put in your room. It is up to you to keep it cleaned. We had two sets of PJs we went to school in. All gray and a set for bed. It was up to us to keep them clean. Uniform must be maintained. Hair must be maintained. Our grades must stay high. No excuses, no exceptions. By the time a week was up, she had broken us. N and A stayed stubborn, but even they broke by the second week. Then the appeals. You want release? Write us an essay on why you think you're ready to return to society. Then an interview to determine your leniency. Myself and my younger sister L managed to be allowed outside beyond the yard. It took several days for the others to follow. By the end of the month, we were ready to do anything my mother asked us to. Then, on the same day as last time, she and RG came into our rooms and dumped garbage bags upon garbage bags. Every book to every Lego was in there, marked with our names. All our stuff was brought back, and my mother dumped them all out onto the floor and said, When I come back up here, whatever is on the floor, goes in the garbage. We cleaned that ish up fast. 
we never ignored our chores again. And our final story of the day. Make my life a nightmare and hack my email? Enjoy being expelled. Sorry for formatting. Mobile schmobile. English is my first language, but I apologize for any mistakes. I'm not sure if this belongs here or on r slash petty revenge, as her getting expelled didn't affect her in the long run. More on that later. I'm cross-posting this from another subreddit. Background. I had to move to Sweden a few years back due to my parents' job. When they went to look for schools, they found an international school that seemed relatively normal and enrolled me and my brother in it. I finished third grade and left right after sixth. This is one of the many tales that I remember from those three years. I have more that I may post at a later date if anyone's interested. It just feels good that there's a place I can vent about my experiences. The Cast Me, the craft-obsessed kid who lives on yarn, anime, and EDM. Entitled Kid, The Bully, Skinny Indian Girl with a Bad Attitude. Nice Kid, We became friends after a little while. She was a lovely girl and I do miss her sometimes. We've got the teacher, the principal, and dad, the most awesome dad in the universe. Story. It was spring in my fourth grade year and I had a rough start. Entitled Kid and her friends had began picking on me, since at the time I was an easy target that they could pin the blame on. Things escalated from kicking me in the back for several months to hiding my stuff from my cubby and even destroying my personal belongings. These could all be separate stories in the future. I went to the teacher several times, but she did nothing. She was the kind of teacher who taught class with documentaries. There was little to no class discussion. One day I came home to my parents, glaring me down with their laptop open to an extremely hateful email sent to everyone, even nice kid, sent out of my school email account. My parents had a giant discussion with me, but it was soon clear that I wasn't the one who sent the email as it had been sent around 2245 or 1045 PM. The previous night, and even though I had my phone next to my bed, Dad knew that I wouldn't have been able to send it as I had been fast asleep by that time. Dad took the evidence to the principal, but he brushed him off and told him that their IT would look into it. Now, I better mention that my dad hails from a place that had a lot of political unrest in the 90s. There still is resentment between the countries, which shaped him as a person. A, this person will take care of it, attitude would not suffice to him. He's pretty good at arguing. With a lot of pressure from my parents, Principal caved in and got the IP address of the device that sent the email. It was entitled kids. I confronted her and she admitted it was her. I was livid and wanted to punch her right there in the face. But given my reputation as a troublemaker and easy target, I had to hold myself back. She explained that most of the class, nice kid was not involved, had pitched in to gain my trust and find out my password. It was pretty weak at the time. Then she used it to gain access to my email and send the email. By the time she was expelled, she was leaving for another school anyway, but I still hope that it got on her school records. I'm much better now since I'm back in the USA. School here is much, much better than that school. Entitled Kid, if you're reading this, I have questions. Are you truly happy about the pain you inflicted for years upon me? Do you even remember me? To anyone who is reading this, thank you. This has been weighing on my chest for five years now, and I needed a place to let it go. Thank you for reading once again, and I hope you have a wonderful day. I'll be willing to answer most questions if anyone asks. This entitled mother decides I'm too poor for my fiance, and she should marry her son. Sorry, it seems like this post was deleted by someone, so here's a re-upload. Good morning, night, or afternoon, wherever you live. I hope you've had a great Easter and enjoyed your small holiday. Forgive me, but this is my first post to Reddit and was pushed by my fiancé to do so. Here's my story. Backstory. I was on a trip to this place called Rotorua, located in New Zealand. I live in the UK. I had taken my fiancé overseas for an Easter celebration of sorts. I thought the best way to do it was to have a relaxation trip. Now, Rotorua is known for their great mud baths and just baths all around, so me and my fiancé decided to take one. I'm 28 and my fiancé is 26, though she may not look to be that old. Our cast, we've got the entitled mother, entitled kid, fiancé, me, and John, who's my friend. I booked a mud bath for the two of us and we went in. Not too long after, I got out to buy some drinks and told my fiancé she should stay and relax. 
When I came back, there was a kid around 19 standing next to the mud bath. This was a room that clearly said occupied and my fiance was using an open robe type bathing suit. Why are you in here? The public pool is full and definitely not with hot chicks. On the other hand, these rooms seem to be empty with some, checks her out, thing else. Sorry, but I put my hand on his shoulder from behind. What the heck, man? Who are you? And don't just bust into rooms like that. This room's taken. Yes, I know. Taken by my fiance, right? What? Y you? Yes, and if you'll excuse us, we would like to be left alone. She's wasted on a person like you? Look at you. Turns to my fiance. Is he worth it? You could do so much better. Watch your mouth. If I'm not worth it, then you certainly can't come close to being worth anything. Entitled kid ignores me. Listen, babe. This poor guy probably can't even afford to give you a room to yourself. I would rather be in a room with him, hence this room you busted into. And did you really call him a poor guy? I can't see why you would even say something like that. Look, he might not be poor in your world, but in mine. Did you see the limo parked in the reserve parking? You mean the black one that's unnecessarily expensive? That's mine. <laughs> What's so funny? I'm sorry, I just can't imagine a drunk teen driving a limousine around for fun. Hey, I'm sorry to cut this short, but do you want to get out now? <sighs> okay, I'm getting out. At this time, there's a knock on the door and I open it. Hey. Who the hell are you? I thought I had heard someone bothering you, young. No worries, but we're getting out now. Could you please help me get this guy out? Then, as you've heard, please leave now. Entitled Kid mumbles and John grabs his arm to pull him out. Don't touch me, you old man. John was in his early 60s. Then please just get out. This isn't over, you commoner. He leaves and we get changed. We are heading out to the parking lot with John and the same entitled kid comes over to us with his entitled mom. The entitled mom was wearing a gold-plated watch and a Gucci bag. You know it's about to go down if a 40-year-old woman is wearing Gucci. I heard you tried to take this girl away from my son, you dirty commoner. Ma'am, we're leaving, so please can you- Hey, let's go, my car's that way. He goes to grab my fiance. No! She starts screaming. I grabbed his wrist and twisted it. Ah! You tried to hurt me, you commonwealth dirtbag! No, don't you dare lay your filthy hand on my son. She goes to hit me with the Gucci handbag, and I grab it mid-swing. Robbery! This man is robbing me! The bath staff showed up to clear up the mess. They had cameras, so they knew instantly who came in the wrong. That was a night, wasn't it? I'm tired. My sincere apologies, sir. I should have been there next to you. It's Easter, John. Don't mind it. You need holidays, too. John gets in the driver's seat, now fully dressed as a butler, and we pull out of the reserved parking with my limousine. Classic stretch. And pass by the two dirty commonwealth. I lowered my windshield and waved to them. This is indeed my first post on my shared account, and I do very much hope that you all enjoyed an encounter of me with an entitled parent. Hope you all celebrated a great Easter with your family and enjoy one last day off with your loved ones. I know I have. Next up we've got Entitled Bride Finds Out Her Kid Isn't a Superhero Entitled Kid Finds Out the Hard Way That a Band's Stage Area at a Wedding Isn't a Playground So I'm 38, male, UK. A musician in a wedding band and as such, you expect the odd Bridezilla now and again. But this particular occasion managed to be a lovely crossover between Entitled Parent and Entitled Bride. Hold on to your butts. So basically, I don't know what weddings are like in other parts of the world, but here in the UK at about 8pm, everybody makes their way into the main hall and takes a seat for the bride and groom to enter afterwards and begin the first dance. I've had a few email conversations back and forth with the bride before the night and she seemed perfectly amicable. I spoke to her in person at about half seven after we, the band, were all set up and good to go. She seemed a bit stuck up, but normally I just put it down to them being a little nervous, too busy or in some cases too drunk to care. Stuck up how? Well, I introduced myself 
extended my hand to hers to shake it and she basically ignored it and went back to talking to one of her bridesmaids. I waited for a gap in their conversation and said, Hi, just letting you know that we're good to go for the first dance at 8. Looking forward to it. Bride then turned around to me and said, Can you not see I'm busy? Just go away and do your job. That's what I've paid you for. All right, so she's not very nice. That's fine. I've dealt with horrible brides before. Couldn't spy the groom anywhere, so I did exactly what she said and buggered off for a while. So 8 p.m. rolls around and we're on the stage waiting for everyone to pile into the room. About 10 minutes later, we get the thumbs up from the wedding coordinator to announce them into the room. I announce them in. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on the dance floor for their first dance as husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Blah Blah Blah. Everyone's clapping. They walk in, but Bride looks fuming. She marches right up to me and says, I wanted you to announce us as the Blah Blahs. So I smiled, apologized, and tried not to let it bother me, saying, Ladies and gentlemen, give them a big round of applause as they take the dance floor. The Blah Blahs. Yeah, that's better, the bride says, stomping onto the dance floor. So by now, you've got a decent idea of what kind of person I'm dealing with here. Very rude. A control freak. I've met brides before who are control freaks, but 99% of the time, they're still lovely and doesn't suffer fools apparently. So we get stuck into the first dance. Perfect by Ed Sheeran. So original. There are videographers, photographers, and about 70 or 80 guests there. So you can imagine, for most wedding bands, the first dance is the main part of the night that you simply have to get right. It's pretty stressful, but as long as you're confident and know the song, you're golden. That is, unless bride's snot-nosed infant decides it's time to enter your life. This kid appears out of nowhere and starts running around the bride and groom. He's about just above knee height, so I don't know, maybe three years old? For some reason, he's carrying some sort of stick with a ball at the end of it, kind of like a wizard's wand. They're laughing. Everyone thinks it's funny and cute. Haha, ha, great. Then, the kid decides it would be a great idea to abandon them both, and while we're performing the most important song of the evening, he runs up to the drum kit and starts absolutely smashing the cymbals while my drummer is trying to play the song. Now, cymbals, and most musical equipment, are very expensive and they don't appreciate being hammered by things that aren't drumsticks. This is literally property damage, but what the heck. It's nothing we haven't dealt with before. For some reason, people assume that bands are totally cool with having their equipment played with and damaged despite the fact that it's our primary source of income. Anyway, I'm just singing away, trying to ignore it and assuming that someone, anyone, will come and collect the kid. An aunt, an uncle, a grandparent. Nope. That would be the logical thing to do. So, nope. I'm trying to sing this song just at the second chorus and all you can hear is this ting 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 smash smash smash. My drummer stops playing for a couple of bars to politely gesture to the entitled kid to move away. Entitled kid stops for a few seconds. So I think, okay, good. So we're almost at the end of the song and the kid is running back and forth from my side of the stage area to the other. There are cables all over this area and speaker stands which, with enough force, could be knocked over if tripped into. Not only that, but the drum kit itself. Bride seems oblivious to the fact that her son could be about to get his ear sliced off by a cymbal. Yes, they're surprisingly sharp edged. Who'd have known? You see where I'm going. We finished the song. We made it. Bride doesn't applaud. Groom seems happy enough though. The kid goes away for a while and I'm amazed that nobody in the room thought it would be a good idea just to hold him until at least the first dance was over. So we kick off the night. Halfway through, literally the second song of the evening, I have to stop the song halfway through because Entitled Kid keeps throwing a balloon and it keeps either going straight at my face or into my stage area. Pedals, more cables, mic stand, cymbals, not much space. Basically dangerous for a kid. So I just say to the kid, try and keep the balloon away from where we are, please, buddy. And I smile at him. 
Untitled Kid looks confused for a second, and then takes the balloon and goes away. We keep playing. Boom! Two minutes later, Bride walks up and stops the next song, demanding to speak to me, holding her Untitled Kid, who is now crying. Did you tell my son he can't play? What? No, I only asked that he try to stay away from our stage area. As you can see, it's quite dangerous. He can play wherever he wants. You've made him cry. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to upset him. I was just saying we don't want him to get hurt. The drum kit can be quite dangerous, and he could trip over something. He's perfectly capable of looking after himself, you know. This is my wedding. You're right. We just don't want him to end up getting injured. So would you mind just keeping him away from where we're playing? Bride says nothing, looking like I've just taken a crap on her carpet and walks away with her kid still crying, holding his balloon. All right, so I feel at this point like I've done enough to warn her about the dangers of letting entitled kid near all of our equipment. I realize I'm really dragging this out now, so here's the kicker. About two hours later, Entitled Kid has still been hovering around the stage annoying me. I've been forced to guide him away from several dangerous positions. Entitled Kid is running around the dance floor. The dance floor isn't really far from the band, something I hate about that particular venue. The stage area is tiny compared to the dance floor, and the kid is running around like crazy. He slips. He puts a hand out. He slices his finger on a cymbal. There's blood on the dance floor which I didn't notice until my guitar player stopped playing with a horrified expression. The kid's screaming. Bride is nowhere to be seen. I stop the song. I take my bass off and have a look. The kid's index finger is like hanging off. It was minging. You can actually see the bone. So a guest finally comes up while another one runs to get the bride. I'm freaking out, telling my drummer to phone an ambulance. I know it sounds absolutely stupid now, but I was genuinely panicking, thinking, oh my god, this kid is gonna die or something. <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but at the time I was freaking. Bride comes in, announces her presence with an ear-splitting shriek, picks up the kid and instead of carrying him elsewhere, stands there and screams at me. This is your fault. Look what you've done. Look what you've done to my boy. Hotel doctor comes down. Ambulance comes to take the kid to the hospital shortly after. Bride and groom leave with the kid. Needless to say, we packed up all of our stuff. Drummer had to disinfect the symbol later, and we left. We didn't get paid, obviously, and Bride left us a review which was genuinely full of so many expletives and untruths that I could barely read it. Basically, she tried to imply that I was being horrible and bullying her kid all night. So, moral of the story is, if you're going to bring kids to a wedding, make sure you can either A. Control them B. Get someone else to look after them or C. Don't act like your kid is a superhero who can't do anything wrong and can withstand the sharp edges of a symbol. This was about two years ago. Thankfully, nothing like this has happened since. But the amount of parents who just let their kids do whatever they want at weddings amazes me. Edit. Thank you for my first gold. Just to answer a couple of questions when I say we didn't get paid, we still kept the deposit, which is half the fee, and our agent eventually, after about two months of back and forth with the bride, in which he finally threatened to sue her, she coughed up the rest of the cash. Apologies, I should have made it clear that we didn't get paid on the night, but we did months later. Also, yes, these days we take payment no less than a month in advance for each wedding. You live and learn. Some are asking how the heck this could have happened as symbols are generally not so sharp. I absolutely agree. Apologies if I've made them sound like the deadliest weapons on earth, but I'm pretty sure for a child, anything can be dangerous against itself. I don't mean they're gonna go all John Wick. It was a freak accident. I wish I could have actually seen it happen so I could tell you more, but the whole night is a pretty horrific, long lasting memory in my mind. So I understand why people think this is fake but my memory of the kid's finger hanging off speaks for itself. I've even got a couple of lovely DMs saying I should make it believable next time and whatnot. Yes, because I'm so starved of attention, I make up a story about a small child almost losing his finger. Is that what people usually do on Reddit? And for all the people saying I should have taken them to court, 
My agent eventually threatened to until they coughed up the full payment for the night. This is the advantage of working for an agency. Yeah, they take a cut of your earnings, but they'll back you up in these situations and deal with all the ugly paperwork. And our final story of the day, Entitled Mom Tries to Get Me Fired for Doing My Job. So this happened a few months ago at my seasonal job working at a skating rink. I meant to tell it sooner, but I just didn't. This story takes place on a Sunday afternoon during a public skate, and most of it is what I was told happened by my coworker and supervisors. The cast is as follows. Entitled Mom, Me, Coworker, Driver 1, The Day Shift Driver, and Driver 2, The Night Shift Driver. So during the twice weekly public skates, in which you pay $3 to skate for two hours, my job was to skate around and make sure everyone followed the very simple rules. The entitled mom in this situation was breaking the rule of no skating backwards, a very common rule to break. As it was my job, I kindly told her she's not allowed to skate backwards. This is when the confrontation started. Excuse me, ma'am. You're not allowed to skate backwards during public skates. Oh, it's okay. I'm teaching her her daughter to skate okay but you're going to have to find a way to do that without skating backwards do you have a manager i can talk to at this point i knew what kind of person i was dealing with and was filled with excitement at meeting a real karen and dread at dealing with a real karen yeah he's over there by the zamboni doors entitled mom leaves her daughter and skates over to confront driver number one that was the last I dealt with her, as she left shortly after. The rest is conversation constructed from what I heard from my coworker and supervisors, and as such is not 100% accurate as to what was said, but it contains the main points. Excuse me, that man is telling me that I can't skate backwards when I'm teaching my daughter. Yeah, that's one of the rules. It's for safety reasons. Well, how am I supposed to teach my daughter? At this point, driver one, who just finished refilling the Zamboni, came over to deal with her. You're gonna have to find a way around it, or you can go upstairs and sign her up for skating lessons on Tuesday night. What time is that at? They go from seven to eight. That won't work. Her bedtime is six. Keep in mind, the kid looked no younger than eight years old. <laughs> well, then I'm sorry, but you're out of luck. Entitled mom then left. On my Friday night shift the next week, Driver 2 filled me in on what happened after Entitled Mom left, which was shortly after Driver 2 arrived for her shift. Again, this is reconstructed from what I was told. Excuse me, can I have the names of everyone working right now? Why? I'm going to call the city and get them fired. What did they do? They told me I can't skate backwards, even though I'm teaching my daughter to skate. You won't get them fired for that. They're doing their jobs. Entitled mom, realizing she can't win, then left. I never saw her again after that day. Bully landlord gets it in the end. Edit, too long didn't read at the bottom. My first husband was not a very nice man. For six years, I was belittled and basically a baby factory for him. He was a fantastic father, but a horrible husband. After he finally got his heirs, I was then treated even worse until I finally woke up and decided to leave him. This revenge story is not about him, I just had to set the scene. I moved out from the house, taking just my clothes, the car, 4k value, no more, and the computer. I had nothing, stayed at a girlfriend's for a couple weeks before I was able to line up a crabby townhouse with roommates, I had nothing, and my bed was a cat pee smelling free couch I was able to score. I wound up having three to four jobs, with one of them being full time and once a week. I would not even be able to sleep a night between jobs, meaning having to stay up for almost 48 hours. Now, fast forward one year. My divorce was finalized and I had fulfilled my year's lease for the townhouse. By this time, I was able to furnish the home and my bedroom and my kids' room when they would be with me for visitation. The scumbag landlord, we'll just call him SBL was a nicest landlord during the time of my tenancy, and I was a good tenant, never being late with my rent. Although I had roommates, I was the sole name on the lease. 
Landlord would show up often with some guys that he had to work on something like plumbing tests or whatever excuse he could come up with, just so he could be all creepy and hang around trying to converse with me and mild undertones that made me quite uneasy at times. Finally, the lease was fulfilled and I was now onto a month to month contract to which at that time I was ready to move out of this crappy townhouse and found a great house in the mountains nearby and I was simply thrilled now that I got my feet on the ground and can afford a bit better than slum living. My lease stated that I had to give one month's notice in order to move out. Unfortunately, I was able to get the house I was to move into for the next month, only three weeks away. I sent an email to the landlord stating that I intend on moving out at the end of the month, in three weeks, and he can try to find another tenant. But I did state that if he didn't find a tenant, I would still fulfill my legal obligation and pay next month's rent. Within one week, two weeks before I was to move out, he emailed me back and stated that was very generous of my offer but he was able to find a new tenant for the beginning of next month and I should be off the hook. He even tipped his hand by stating that he had already collected a deposit from them. Now, something happened within a couple days after that which was no fault of my own, nor my roommates. The townhouse came with its own appliances, fridge, oven, etc., including a clothes washer and dryer on the main level. My roommate had put a load of laundry in and went to the living room to have a nap. He awoke to find that the washer had malfunctioned with the sensory switch, which never stopped the water fill stage, and there was an inch of water in the kitchen and living room. He splashed through the water to turn off the washer and called me to help to deal with this. I was just getting off work and I whipped home to assess the damage. It was bad. There was standing water on top of the living room carpet and a good inch of water in the whole kitchen. I called the landlord and told him about the issue. By the time the landlord showed up, I had already got most of the standing water out with the help of my roommates and friends that showed up with shop vacs. Landlord didn't seem too upset, which was surprising for me, and had an appliance repair man come to look at the washer. The repair man even said, yup, that's the culprit, and showed how the dial would stick on the fill stage and wouldn't click over to the agitate stage. After replacing the dial and lubricating the whole deal, he left. The next week was chaos as I was busy trying to pack and landlord had insurance guys in assessing and workers taking out the carpet and cutting two feet worth of the lower drywall of the whole main level. The day of the move, though I was still supposed to be there for a couple more days, landlord had let himself in as movers were moving out my stuff with a camera going around taking pictures of everything. I honestly thought that it was for his insurance claims, etc. I actually felt bad for the landlord. I'm too nice and told him that I would not ask for any of my deposit bag and he responded in front of the loading crew and my roommate. Thank you, that's very generous of you. We parted ways and I thought that was that. I was wrong. Two weeks into my new home location, landlord showed up on my doorstep with a summons to appear in arbitration because he was suing me. What? On what grounds? He stated it's all in the paperwork and handed me a manila envelope with 18 pages of everything he was charging me with, all including photos. Now I know why he was going around taking pics. Nickel and diming me on everything, from a bent Venetian blind that was like that when I had moved in, and some scuffs on walls, etc, etc. But then, he also wanted me to pay his insurance deductible and that following month's rent. He claimed that the tenants that he had lined up backed out at the last minute, claiming that they didn't think the place would be ready in time with the new drywall and paint and so on, so he still wanted me to pay that month's rent. Really? I knew I was more than generous of giving him my whole deposit and then for him to come back and sue me for thousands? He was not only claiming the damages caused by the flood, but improvements he needed to do that should never be or have been my responsibility in the first place. Even cracks in the living room wall that was from the building settling how should I be responsible for that? Even new lighting, faucets, etc. All mainly on the accusation that I was being negligent. I wasn't going to have that. I know it was a slummy townhouse complex and most of his tenants were just welfare cases and maybe he could get away with this with others, but not me. No way. I had just got out of a marriage that made me feel insignificant and had horrible self-esteem. 
But now I had my dignity and felt strong for the first time in a long time. No way was I going to let any more stuff happen to me without my doing something about it. I had 10 days left before the date of my arbitration meeting. I immediately got to work, first getting a signed deposition from the very repairman that had showed that day, stating that the appliance was quite in need of maintenance work and the last time he had done any maintenance for him was almost five years before. From thoroughly reviewing my rental contract and local laws, landlord is obligated to have all appliances maintained, serviced every year. I had also talked to some of the other tenants and had heard that this wasn't the first time the landlord had sued tenants after the fact. I hunted them down and got sworn statements from them also. Unfortunately for them, they didn't know what to do and mostly didn't show up at arbitration. Hence, landlord winning by default. No way, I was not going to let him do this to me. I then drew up a rebuttal to each and every claim he had, including photos from the year that I had lived there, printed out all my email correspondence, and even convinced my ex-roommate and one of the movers that heard my interaction with the landlord about him stating how generous it was of me letting him keep my whole deposit, which was a significant amount to come. Day of Arbitration I dressed up in my power suit and with my ex-roommate and worker in tow, showed up at the meeting. Now, in Canada, arbitration is not held in a courtroom per se, but it's still held at the courthouse in a conference room with a judge. We had one hour with this judge. Since landlord was the plaintiff, he got to go first with his case. He spent over 40 minutes going over everything, and I sat quietly until he finished. Once he finished, I then hauled out the rebuttal in multiple copies, handed to the judge, to the landlord, and to anyone else that wished to have one and I quickly went over each point. Landlord was irate and interrupted almost every second sentence I spoke. I would pause the moment he would start talking and say sweetly, I was quiet and polite during your time to present your case. I hope you grant me the same respect. Landlord started to get red in the face, especially when I got to the deposition of the maintenance worker for the appliance. I included with that the Tenancy Landlord Act sections pertaining to appliance maintenance and stated that this was the only record of maintenance that had occurred, and unless he can come up with more recent records from perhaps another company, it was five years since anything had been looked at. With my defense, I had also then countered that I would like my deposit back and my day's pay from work since I had to take that day off to go to this meeting. The judge then made his statement, and I will always remember this for the rest of my life. He stated that first he was very impressed of my presentation, and that I obviously have a good handle on things, and can tell that my nature is of kindness and respect, especially with photos of how I had the townhouse furnished and clean and pride in whatever home I would live in. Bottom line, not only did I win the case, I wound up having landlord owing me over 80% of my deposit back, including interest, Landlord's face was priceless. The judge then proceeded to tell Landlord that they will be reviewing again all his previous filings, and if there was enough evidence of harassment, he would be reported to the Board of Landlords and Tenants. I don't really know if anything came out of that. Now, I walked away that day feeling on top of the world, completely justified, and he got a taste of his own medicine. But it didn't stop there. Oh no. Knowing that this guy has a history of suing tenants, I printed up my final results and judge's signature and gave a copy to each and every tenant in that complex. I wanted to warn every one of his practices and to keep notes, photos, etc. so that he wouldn't do that to them. But I didn't stop there. He still now owed me money, hee <laughs> hee, and I asked repeatedly for the payment. He never responded. He had until a certain day to pay me back my deposit and on that day, I had gone to his house. I looked up his residence under public records, as he is a landlord and had to file under a certain address, and knocked on the door. He didn't answer, though I knew he was home. I rang the bell a few more times and knocked loudly. He then turned his house alarm on, which at first startled me, but quickly turned to humor seeing how much of a wimp this bully turned out to be. I then yelled out loud enough that I am not going anywhere. He yelled out, Get off my property or I will call the police. Okay, no problem. I got off the property but camped out on the front sidewalk. I had a fold-up chair, a cooler with water and sodas, 
a few sandwiches and all of my paperwork with me. I was set to stay there forever. I then would tell anyone that would walk by. Already there were some people there from the house alarm fiasco about how I was a tenant and he wrongfully sued me and that I now have a claim against him and he now owes me money. I let anyone look at the paperwork just to back up my claim. The police did show up. They first went to talk to the landlord and he was claiming that I was harassing him, slandering him and wouldn't leave his property. I was on public property, the sidewalk, and it isn't slander if it's true, of which I had all my court signed paperwork to back me up. I wasn't disturbing the peace. I was simply and quietly seated outside his home and just talking to neighbors about his actions. He was out yelling that I need to leave, and I quietly stated that I would be happy to leave once I am paid that he was legally obligated to do by that date. I was not going to leave before I got money in my hand, and I was more than willing to stay there and tell anyone that would listen to me why I was camped out. The police stated I wasn't doing anything wrong, and it's public property. I wasn't disturbing the peace, and it isn't slander if it's true. Finally, after an hour of landlord yelling on his front lawn at the policeman, and at me of course, did his wife come out with money. She handed the money to the police, of which in turn handed the money to me, and signed off documenting final payment was complete. I sweetly smiled, thanked the police deeply, and went home. I have no idea what ever happened to this landlord and if he is still pulling things like this on others, but I hope that I helped put the fear of God in him and that he just can't go around messing with people because eventually it will come back and bite him in the butt. Sometimes nice guys or girls finish last, but with patience, they finish with a win. Too long didn't read. I see comments that I didn't have this in, so here it is. Sorry about that. Friendly, creepy slumlord could have walked away with my money but instead he pushed too far with the wrong person and wound up owing and being owned instead. Edit. Thanks everyone for the awards and upvotes. This is my first reveal post in something like this. I cannot believe how this is blowing up. Warm fuzzies to all of you. Next up we've got Drive Like a Jerk? Enjoy your wrecked truck. Obligatory mobile user. Sorry if the formatting is not good. Too long didn't read at the bottom. This is not my story, but rather my grandfather's. A little background. My grandfather has a very short fuse when it comes to dealing with other people's BS. He's sort of mellowed out now as he's gotten older, but when he was younger, I've been told his temper was legendary. At the time of this story, my grandfather was living on a small farm. Next to his house, a raised levee that was made of dirt and covered in loose gravel. The levee formed a backward C shape as it went by his house since it followed the path of the river, with his house on the outside curve. This, along with the trees on both sides of the road, created a blind curve in the road that will be important later. During harvest season, numerous trucks would drive past his house to and from the various farms in the area to pick up produce and take it where it needed to go. A problem arose, however, when the truck drivers started ignoring the posted speed limit 10 to 15 miles per hour and going too fast around the aforementioned curve. This speeding caused the trucks to throw rocks, gravel, and huge clouds of dust down onto my grandfather's house on a daily basis. Naturally, this was quite annoying, as his backyard was getting covered in dust and the rear of his house was being constantly peppered by rocks. First, he tried speaking to the truck drivers themselves, which went nowhere. Then, he tried talking to the owners of the trucking company, which didn't do anything either. He even put up homemade signs on his stretch of the road asking the trucks to slow down, but it was to no avail. At this point, my grandfather realized that he was going to have to do something more provocative to get their attention. So one night, he got his tractor out with a bulldozer blade in the front, scraped up some dirt, and built a homemade speed bump just around the blind curve of the road. And I don't mean a modern, mostly flat speed bump either, 3 to 4 inches tall. By his own estimation, this thing was about 8 to 10 inches in the center, so more like a small mound. To top it all off, it was perfectly positioned so that by the time a driver saw it, it would be way too late to even try and slow down. He didn't have to wait long to see the results. The very next morning, he was sitting in his kitchen when he heard a loud crashing noise outside. Upon investigating, he found a truck that had fallen right into his trap. It had driven around the curve going way too fast, 
hit the mound full speed, lost control, and driven straight off the 25-foot levee into a giant olive tree. This completely wrecked the truck, as the tree hadn't budged at all with the impact. The driver, though stunned by the accident, was mostly unharmed, and proceeded to have my grandfather rip into him over his speeding. As you can imagine, there was no more speeding from those truckers ever again. The cherry on top was that the company that owned the trucks actually had to pay him to use his tractor to pull the truck back onto the road, as the area was too far from town for any tow trucks to come out and no one else in the area had a big enough tractor. Too long didn't read. Speeding trucks throwing rocks at my grandfather's house, he responds by building a massive speed bump that sends a truck flying. Edit. Wow, this blew up. That's awesome. Love reading all the comments and discussion. At this point, I'd like to say that what my grandfather did was highly dangerous, as many people have pointed out. He is incredibly lucky that things turned out the way they did. Please don't go and build your own speed bump. Thankfully, we live in a time where it is much easier to hold people accountable for things like speeding and can take people like the truck drivers to court. This is an option that was more than likely unavailable to my grandfather at the time, for many reasons, but mostly due to the fact that he was poor and had to spend 12 to 14 hours a day working at this point. Also, he did take the speed bump down after this incident. I think the results shocked him a bit as well. Edit 2 for clarification, the truck did not fly through the air into the tree. That would have killed the driver for sure. The truck drove off the levee and only hit the tree after going through a bit of dirt and field. This would, in my opinion, have slowed the truck down a bit before the final impact. Also, the speeds at which these take place at are not normal freeway speeds. From my own experience driving on these levees, the driver couldn't have been going more than maybe 25 to 30 miles per hour as the levees are not paved and can be treacherous at high speeds. I'd also like to mention again that this was a large truck, not a small car, so the heavier weight likely also contributed to the lack of injuries. And before we start our final story, if you're enjoying these, please let me know by giving the video a thumbs up. Relentlessly bully me, jerk? Let thou social life burn. So, this is my first post. I'm gonna keep it brief because I'm quite tired, but for our cast, we've got me, We've got a psychopath, and we've got the awesome friend. So this story was over the course of like two years. It all started in ninth grade, my first year of high school. I was taking computer science, and I loved the class, as it was easy and fun. We'd all be able to just do whatever we wanted in the class. I still got all my work done. One day of the third month, enter the psychopath. Dun, dun, dun. Psycho was a very seemingly nice guy. He was tall and had blue shades. He and I started talking about something, don't remember and such. Well, a week later, I forget about talking to the guy and I am chasing after my friend, don't remember why. All of a sudden, I run past the guy who stops me and talks to me. I was in a rush, but the guy seemed really cool and he asked where my friends and I hang for lunch. Big mistake. He starts hanging out with us every day and by second semester, None of my old friends sit with me because of Psycho. They are scared of him. I was stupid and didn't know why anyone would be scared of Psycho. But as time went on, I became more aware and aware of his weird things. He would, on several occasions, threaten me and my family, talking about his army and his gangs, and how bad people were right. I came to a realization that this guy was a bit nuts, and I'm a bit forgiving, and so... I gave him the benefit of the doubt. What is wrong with me? Anyways, next semester occurs and I get a new computer partner. Awesome friend. Psycho walks up to me like he regularly does and talks to me like a five-year-old who broke something and awesome friend sees this. The long and short of it is awesome friend brought my doubts to the surface, made me realize what a weirdo Psycho really is. Me and him try to get help out of this toxic relationship. The first time, I really, really tried, but the thing is, Psycho is a psychopath, as he can convince bears to fly if he wanted, so he manipulates me into forgiving him for his behavior. But then, one day he goes off on me for something, and starts threatening me, and pets me like a dog. At this point, I was done. Alone, he walks up to me, and I yell at him with almighty hell. After this day, he finally got the memo. We are through, and he leaves me alone. He promised. 
Getting rid of Psycho was like Spider-Man removing the symbiote in Spider-Man 3. Good riddance, I thought. Flash to 10th grade. I feel hardened, experienced, and one of my childhood friends is now a freshman in my school. However, Psycho comes up every lunch, hangs around my group, and taunts me for the entirety of lunch every day. Me and my group are upset as we want peace, but he denies this. Keep in mind, he is breaking his part of the oath by constantly taunting me. At one point, I broke out crying and slapped him. I'm quite skinny, so it doesn't hurt. He starts to smile, this horribly sinister smile. He and his group start to walk up to me on the regular now, and he taunts me and continues to harass me. I can't even hold a decent conversation with one of my friends without this evil kid and his lackeys coming in to break me. The worst thing is, I can't touch him, he won't let me, because I slapped him. A thing to know, he has autism, but so do I, so I did not care. He tells me, If you go to the Dean, you will be the one suspended. You'll be expelled. Then on Club Rush, I crack. I can't anymore. This bullying, this extreme mental abuse, it's reached its point. He and his friends walk up to me, and I kick him in the leg, to which he mockingly falls over and says, Whoa, whoa, you kicked me. I better tell someone. He tells this with the same sinister smile from before. Then I yell at him. I say the toughest thing I could think of. Time to pay, psycho. You think you're so godly? Oh, I know so. Well, if I have to destroy my life to decimate yours, then it's time I sent it all to hell. Let's see what the dean says. Long story short, I go into her office, write a full four pages on this guy, and get him in serious trouble. She lets me off the hook, as I lashed out in self-defense, bless her soul. I get the school equivalent to a restraining order put on Psycho finally. To add some salt to the wound, his lackeys look up to me as an example, and he starts abusing them to fill my void. Uh-oh. They all leave him. All of them. They talk to me, and I totally understood everything perfectly. Two of his former pals have become two of my very good friends, with one helping me out with personal projects. They all tell me how sick he is, and every time I see him walking by, alone, his social life ruined, I smile a sinister, but feel-good smile. Entitled Aunt kicks out family, asks for money, and loses house. This happened many years ago, and decided to post now as some news came up, and I just had to share. I'll start off with the backstory to set the scene. Sorry for any errors and run-ons. On mobile, and even though English is my first and only language, I'm still bad at it. My entitled aunt owned a nice house with her then-husband. It was built sometime in the 60s, with many rooms. They had many kids, and by many, I mean a lot. So many, they ended up building additional rooms. My entitled aunt was somewhat of an entrepreneur, and ventured in many small business dealings, all of which never lasted. Her last one, as far as I can remember, was in the tax industry, but that ended badly as she was charged with some sort of fraud. I was young, so details are a bit fuzzy. Since then, even at a young age, I knew the family was falling apart. I lived a short walk away and liked to visit my cousin's house every now and then so we could stroll down the street to some creek at one end of the road or some gas station on the other end where they had a sitting area to snack and chat. Some days, as I walked by, I could hear yelling coming from the house, all of the yelling coming from Entitled Aunt. The neighborhood was quite safe and rural enough that kids could play in the street without a care in the world. But as I remember those yells and passing the house knowing I couldn't play with my cousins for a while, it saddens me knowing I could have done something. Again, I was a kid, and a sheltered one at that. I would also like to point out Entitled Aunt was not only verbally abusive, but heavily physically abusive as well. But this is a rant for another time. While Entitled Aunt's marriage was on the line, she decided to open a new business outside of the city, but only take a few of her kids with her and leave the rest to fend for themselves. The dad? I don't know. Maybe he left with Entitled Aunt, or he had left Entitled Aunt at the time. I hardly saw him. As far as the kids she took, it was obvious who the favorites were, because while Entitled Aunt promoted one of the kids she took, because she saw greatness in some ability, I'll be vague with that talent to save face, but one of her kids left behind developed a serious medical illness. Entitled Aunt never came and her excuse was she was busy or that sick kid, 12 years old, was faking it by having seizures. 
I was there when many of them occurred, and it was sad when she cried for her mommy when it happened. Younger me felt helpless in a house full of unsupervised minors. My parents were clueless as to what was happening then, but who knows. This is where it gets interesting and the bricks start to fall. The illness of this kid led to hospitalization. When the hospital asked for a parent, the eldest of one of the left behind kids stated they were away and staying home alone. This triggered CPS involvement, of course, and all the left behind kids that stayed in that house were taken away, except for the eldest who was over 18 years. Entitled aunt never came back into town and her excuse was she was busy. When she was asked to come to a hearing to try to get her kids back, it was another excuse about her husband. Excuse followed excuse and the kids ended up staying in CPS custody till they were either of age or they found foster homes. Back to the house. The eldest eventually moved out to start his own life and the property tax kept adding up with no one paying. My parents didn't want the house to go to waste as it had a good foundation, location, and space. The downside was it needed a lot of renovations and was at risk of foreclosure. Eventually, they contacted the husband who said it was okay to stay there if they managed the financing and he would take care of the renovations. Both my parents wanted to buy the house and talks were progressing to get it. During the time staying there, the tax amount was getting lower and renovation was starting. Everything was good and Entitled Aunt seemed to be out of the picture, seeing as how she severed communication with everyone, including her husband after repeated attempts. Many years passed and the house was becoming somewhat of a halfway house for out of town family and friends coming to our town looking for a fresh start. Many stayed a few months till they could find a decent job and save to move out, but they all helped with bills. No hard feelings and we all got along. We had gotten word that Entitled Aunt's business was raided and she was on the run. The grapevine mentions things of drugs, stolen vehicles and items, and more with her boyfriend. Keep in mind, the divorce with her husband was not final because she refused to sign the paperwork. There are a lot of stories I could share about Entitled Aunt, most of which I experienced firsthand, but this is a summary of it. Then it happened. She was back in town, and what better place to crash than your own home, right? Technically, it was still her home since the divorce wasn't final. So what is the first thing Entitled Aunt says when she shows up unannounced? Get the heck out of my house! At that time, the people staying in the house were me, my parents, my brother, and his very pregnant wife who was due any day. There was a lot of back and forth between Entitled Aunt and my dad, Entitled Aunt's brother, saying that Entitled Aunt's husband said it was okay, but she refused to understand and said the house was still under her name. Entitled Aunt's husband couldn't be reached at the time as he was out of the country for some business matter, and by the time it got dark, the argument seemed to die down a bit but the tension was thick as butter. We were hungry and tired by that time, so my mom went to get some fast food. While she was gone, Entitled Aunt decided to make herself at home and cook up some noodles for her boyfriend. Between these moments, my dad stated that he was making payments and everyone was chipping in to get the taxes back in good standing. To which Entitled Aunt responds with something like, Well, this is my house and I don't have to pay anything. Yeah, that's not how property taxes work. When my mom came back with the food, we, being everyone besides Entitled Aunt and her boyfriend, started to eat. You didn't even bring any food for me and my boyfriend? You selfish woman, Entitled Aunt says, and the argument starts up once again. The horrible thing about the whole situation was we couldn't even kick her out. The house was still under Entitled Aunt's name at the time, and we had no way nor paperwork of proving Entitled Aunt's husband agreed it was okay to stay there. The agreement was more of a verbal contract, and boy did my dad regret it. Towards the end, we decided to pack a few things and stay with a nearby relative, at least until we were able to get in contact with Entitled Aunt's husband. The problem was we needed a few boxes, so we all drove together to some local shop for packing material. When we got out, we found a lot of our belongings all over the yard. Kitchen chairs, clothes, personal effects, even the new crib for the upcoming baby wasn't spared. The police were called and Entitled Aunt was ordered to allow us 72 hours to pack up and leave, to which she tried to play the victim card. They are squatters. I never gave them permission to stay here. They took advantage of me being out of town to live here and ruin my house. Keep in mind, the house was still undergoing renovations. It had bare floors in one of the unused bedrooms and they were getting replaced with hardwood. 
removed wall sections for replacing due to mold, and one of the bathrooms were out of service due to repiping. The house still needed a lot of work, as there was no central air and heating, and the water boiler was dated to get replaced soon. We ended up moving to another house while legal battle between entitled aunt and her husband were in the works, but she ended up living in the house in the long run. We would hear from entitled aunt every now and then when she somehow got hold of our number through a family member, always calling, asking my dad for money. He never shared what was said, but he gave hints along the lines of, I let you stay in this house for so long. When you left, you took everything. Or, this is all your fault. My house is ruined. Or my personal favorite. After everything I've done for you growing up, you do this to your own sister. My dad feels bad, but still gives her a forget you, stop calling. Entitled Aunt's husband knew she was staying in the house and decided to just not deal with it. Paid my dad his money back from the taxes as the agreement was off and just let the house go, not caring about the renovations. If Entitled Aunt wanted the house, she could have it. But just because you have something doesn't mean it's okay not taking care of it. We lost contact with Entitled Aunt once again and we can only hope it's for good. All her kids also disconnected from her due to the abuse bit. They are all living happy and healthy lives. Many years passed and recently we got word through the grapevine of the following. The property taxes were never paid. The house was condemned. Entitled Aunt got a warrant and was arrested on drug related charges. A notice was put to vacate. Entitled Aunt still lived there. Entitled Aunt gets arrested again on auto theft. Entitled Aunt gets booted out of house. House gets foreclosed. A lovely couple now lives in the house. Too long didn't read. Entitled Aunt kicks everyone out of house that was paying the property taxes. Entitled Aunt doesn't pay and loses her house. Next up we've got Entitled Cousin Walks In on an Inappropriate Game. Entitled Aunt Attempts to Sue for Emotional Trauma. Okay, I kind of lied in the title, but Entitled Aunt does think about suing me. For our cast, we've got me, Entitled Aunt, Entitled Cousin, Friend, Granddad, and Uncle. We were having a family reunion because Grandpa set it up and he's one of those really old radical hippie dudes, mid-80s. Not the server type, obviously, but the existential one. Little did I know, he got it from a lot of fun that he had back in the 60s to the 90s, and I'm honestly concerned how he is still alive. Okay, back on track. Every time we had a reunion, the location would change from one of the family's houses to the next. This time, it was ours. So we are having a good party. I'm upstairs chatting with my friend on Xbox Live. Everybody could hear our conversation, but they were confused when they came in my room. Without knocking, very rude, they see only me. About three times that night, I heard an acknowledging, oh, like they had just found the cure to cancer. It was irritating. Friend and me weren't playing the same game, but we were just having a casual chat since friend's parents are strict on curfew and won't let him out past nine. Then, entitled aunt and her kid show up with about 5% left on his Nintendo Switch playing Smash Ultimate. If anyone asks, he was a Bayonetta main and I was a King K. Rule main. Enter this conversation. Mommy, mommy, my game ran out. He cried with crocodile tears. Okay, honey, I'll get you something to play with. Oh, wait, there's OP. Hi, OP. Do you still have your Xbox? This seems innocent at first, but let me give you some backstory. Entitled Cousin is a toxic gamer. I mean, the radiation from the toxicity is instantly deadly as soon as he dies once on Fortnite. He's 11, what did you expect? He has broken not one, not two, but five of my controllers. That's like 400 bucks at least, dude. No, I sold it to get this toaster. Look, it has LED lights. Whoa, cyborg toaster. Obvious lie. What? Why? I swear, OP, you are the dumbest person I have ever met. But toaster. Nobody cares about the toaster, he screamed at the top of his lungs. Whoa, dude, breathe in, out, in, out. I don't care about your meditating bull. Why would you sell your Xbox? Because toaster. The toaster was 15 bucks at most. Entitled cousin storms off to his mom crying. I thought he was going to suffocate. He was wasting so much oxygen on crying. 
I go back to my room to avoid the 11 year old baby and play some watchdogs for the nostalgia. You know the part where something inappropriate happens? Yeah, I was on that bid. Entitled Cousin walks in and sees something he's way too young to see. Entitled Cousin is now traumatized and runs out to his Entitled Mom again. Enter Entitled Aunt Part 2. What did you show my son? It was an accident, I swear, and I never gave him permission to come in my room. He's not a vampire. He can go wherever he wants. Okay, I'm fine with that. Just stay out of my room from now on. My little angel can do whatever he wants. Entitled Cousin told me everything. I'm taking all your electronics and I'm suing you for emotional trauma. First of all, you can't take my stuff. That's stealing. Second, get out of my room. Third, even if you tried to sue me, I could just say that you tried to steal my belongings, which is true. And fourth, I never gave him permission to come in my room and he should know basic manners by now. All of this is your fault and you are setting a bad example for your child. This lady has the audacity to throw a comeback with, However, I am the adult and you are a dumb 14 year old. My mom said we are taking all of your stuff and that's fine. Oh, OP, see what happens when you open your mouth? This is because you are a dumb 14 year old and you have the nerve to talk back to me. I am an adult and I can punish you however I want. The wild grandpa stalks his prey, presumably entitled aunt and entitled cousin. The wild grandpa strikes with a comeback and overheard the last parts of the conversation. Get out of my daughter's house now. I don't know why my son married you. To think I have a thief for a daughter-in-law. My friend was like, I heard that entire conversation too. He has a really bad microphone, so that's why he hadn't said anything and had only fixed it now. It is convenience. I was shocked as well. I thought he was away from keyboard or something, but little did I know. My friend went into absolute sicko mode on Entitled Ant. My friend said, OP's Ant. Stop touching OP stuff or I will call the cops. We will agree to sue you for attempted theft and verbal abuse. You are in the wrong. You better wake up. Keep in mind there are more people defending OP than you, so there's little chance the trial will be in your favor. You will be in community service and I know the type of person I'm dealing with. You are the type of person who thinks everything can be handed to them on a silver platter. But guess what? If you don't leave OP alone now, you will be lucky to find a plastic bag to use. Entitled Aunt was very religious and thought Satan was speaking to her. She isn't the most tech savvy person in the world and confuses a Nintendo Switch for a Game Boy. Yeah, she knows nothing about tech. Spawn of Satan! Leave me alone or I will pull out the crucifix on you. You dare hurt a person of God. I will exorcise you with my own bare hands. My friend was like, Kay. I am in the right, because I follow the word of God. Anybody who doesn't agree with me has crawled out of the depths of hell. Grandpa was getting very upset and called out to my uncle to get Entitled Aunt out of my room. I forgot about Entitled Cousin and saw him running down the stairs with my Xbox One, two terabyte and around 80 digital games, and running as fast as he can to Entitled Aunt and my uncle's car. Thankfully, Grandpa and my uncle got Entitled Aunt out of my room by locking her shoulders, I'm not kidding, and literally lifting her up into the air so she can't move. It was weird. Uncle saw Entitled Cousin with my Xbox. My Xbox is the original black, and Entitled Cousin already had an Xbox One S, which are white. I don't know why he stole my Xbox. Maybe it was for the games. My uncle. Where did you get that Xbox? It was mine. OP stole it when he came to our house the other week. Don't pull that crap with me. I know your Xbox is white. He repainted it to make it look like it isn't white. Stop. That's my Xbox. See? Give it back now, Entitled Cousin. Entitled Cousin is bawling his eyes out as he gives me my Xbox. Entitled Aunt gets back in the car after Grandpa, my friend, and Uncle threatened to call the cops. Entitled Aunt and Uncle at this point in time are going through a divorce, and for some reason, Entitled Aunt got custody because of laws favoring women in custody of children. Grandpa now helps my uncle pay child support. Excuse me? My uncle makes a great dad, and I think he should have custody. And for our final story of the day, 
entitled aunt tries to gate crash and then destroy my wedding. Before we begin, I think I'm entitled to your thumbs up. Hit the thumbs up and we'll begin. Hello everybody, this is my first foray into this realm. I'll try and get as much detail as possible, but this happened about a year ago, before me and my wife had gotten married. Beware, this is kind of a long one. Too long didn't read at the bottom. And now the story. So me and my fiance got engaged early on in our relationship. I think we were both 19 at the time. By the time we were getting close to the wedding, we were getting all the details ironed out. We wanted to handle most things by ourselves to save on money. But for things like a venue, we obviously had to shell out a little money. The cake was being handled by Entitled Ant. The photography by Entitled Ant's nice son. He did photography as a hobby and had generously agreed to help us out for free as a wedding present. The problem only began later on down the line when it came to the guest list. Due to our budget, we really only had room for very close friends and family at the wedding, meaning if we didn't know someone particularly well on the other side of each other's family, they simply didn't get an invite. It was our wedding and we were going to do it the way we wanted. Eventually, we had all the invites done and the seating plan arranged. We were now in the final month leading up to the wedding and everything was going according to plan. Until... Father-in-law gets a text from Entitled Aunt asking if she can bring her less than a year old granddaughter to the wedding and reception. Bear in mind at this point, all the seats are taken. And although she is an infant, there is a chance the venue may charge us more for an extra head. The church is a public event though, so we craft a reply together which basically says, unfortunately, we can't fit any more room in the reception, but you're more than welcome to bring her to the church service. This didn't sit well with Entitled Aunt. We get a text back saying something along the lines of, Well, she's very small. She can just sit on my lap. It's no problem at all. Completely missing the point that it doesn't really matter what she thought. If the venue caught on, they'd want to charge us more. Being 20 at the time, each of us couldn't really afford that to happen. All of our income was going into this wedding. This back and forth carried on, and eventually, my fiancé decides to visit Entitled Nan to try to get some sense out of the situation. Entitled Nan hadn't been an issue until now. When fiancé turns up at Entitled Nan's house, she happens to see through into her house. Big window facing the road, it's easy enough for anyone to do to be honest, and she's horrified to see none other than Entitled Nan already there. Turns out, she had been spewing out that we were being unreasonable for not allowing her infant granddaughter to the reception even though she's doing our cake for us and we owe her. Please bear in mind, this child's own mother isn't even invited because we didn't know her well enough. This child would not be able to remember anything of the day. We think she just wanted to bring her as a trophy for Grandmother of the Year Award. My fiance couldn't very well walk away after seeing Entitled Aunt as they unfortunately made eye contact as she approached the house. Fiance walks in and says, paraphrasing, I wasn't there, to Entitled Nan, I just wanted to have a chat with you in private, please. Entitled Aunt severely disapproves of this and demands that she remains in the room. Turns out, Entitled Aunt had also been spewing lies about fiance's parents, saying that they've been bullying her and being out of order because they won't let her take her granddaughter. And fiancé, loyal to a fault, stands up for them and says to Entitled Aunt, Don't you dare talk about my parents that way. They've done nothing wrong. This continues for a while until it ramps up a bit. Entitled Aunt, not liking the way this is going, aka losing the argument, squares up to fiancé and tells her to leave. Little known fact, fiancé is a quiet mouse in most situations, but when it's called for, she summons this very tough side of her that I've only seen a handful of times. She sternly informs Entitled Aunt that she's not going anywhere and that she was going to talk to Entitled Nan about the situation in private. Entitled Aunt got fed up of losing the argument and starts insulting my fiancé. Now, fiancé isn't a violent person, but she said on many occasions she wished she had slapped Entitled Aunt right in her face then and there, but she didn't. She kept hold of her anger and instead the emotion hit her as sadness. She had had enough and was stressed out about the wedding. She ran out of the house in tears with Entitled Nan chasing after her trying to comfort her. She hadn't gone full Entitled Nan mode yet. That will come, don't worry. 
Whilst all this was happening, I was at the office. I get a phone call from my fiance in tears, saying she had just been confronted at Entitled Nan's house and that everything about the wedding was going to fall apart. Being in that situation kind of springs you into action. Luckily, fiance had also called father-in-law and mother-in-law who went to her aid. I was unable to leave the office, frustratingly. Needless to say, I was absolutely fuming, but we decided to try and be the better people in the situation. That didn't last for long. The next morning, myself and fiancé woke up to many, many messages on Facebook from Entitled Son. Entitled Aunt's son, father of the fabled granddaughter of the Entitled Aunt, calling myself out for discriminating against his daughter, blaming us for tearing the family apart and threatening us among other things. It was at this point that we had had enough. That part of her side of the family had been nothing but trouble. And with that, we revoked the invitation for Entitled Aunt and Entitled Son. Unfortunately, all of this severed the ties with Entitled Aunt's nice son who was going to do our photography. I can't blame him for having to pull out when his mother was being so stupid. This left us in a rather tricky situation, but lucky for us, my sister is an avid baker in her spare time, and upon my mother hearing about this mentioned to her, she then offered to make us a much larger cake, entirely as we'd like it, all for free. It was an absolute godsend, and I feel obligated to say that everyone loved the cake. They even said that it was some of the best cake they had ever had. We had had three layers, Victoria sponge, chocolate, and red velvet. Photography was also miraculously taken care of. Fiancé's work caught wind of the problem after my fiancé mentioned it to a colleague, and between them pooled money to pay for a professional photographer for the day. The photos were incredible and I feel so privileged that they thought of us like that. I've never been on the end of an act of generosity like that before. It really does make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Anyway, you thought that this story was over? Unfortunately, it's not. Fast forward to the night before the wedding. I'm sleeping at fiance's other grandparents' house, lovely couple, very supportive, for the night as per wedding ritual. Me and fiance had already made our goodbyes, both excited for the following day to finally arrive, and just about had forgotten about all the problems that had happened. But unfortunately, it was not to last. At about 11 p.m., I get a phone call from my fiancé in tears. Turns out, Entitled Aunt had been spreading poisonous lies to her side of the family, saying that we were being verbally abusive to her and Entitled Son, and had kicked them out of the wedding for no reason. This was enough to turn some of the more spineless of her side of the family to back off of the wedding at the last minute, literally the night before. Bear in mind, we had printed out a full table plan that was now ruined. It was handmade and everything. We now had an extra five seats that needed filling. They had been prepaid, so we were going to lose money if we couldn't get them filled. Mother-in-law had a stroke of genius. Turns out, mother-in-law's parents, the nice grandparents, had friends who had gifted me and fiancé early wedding presents even though they didn't need to. They were just happy that the grandchildren of their friends were having a wedding. Mother-in-law and her mother organized inviting them to the wedding and luckily they were free on very short notice. So on the day itself, we didn't have any free seats and all the seats that we did have were used by people who actually wanted to be there. It was a horrendous turn of events but one we are rather grateful for now that we are looking back. A year has passed since this incident. Wedding was in February of 2018 and we cut off communication from our family and Entitled Aunt and Entitled Nan who proceeded to back up Entitled Aunt and say she is innocent to the fury of fiancé as she had witnessed the situation at her home unfold. Entitled Aunt to this day refuses to apologize as she believes she's done nothing wrong. But you can't just go around inviting extra people to someone else's wedding. It doesn't work like that. I'm pleased that our lives are now carrying on without the toxic energy that we were getting from them. I'm glad we experienced this when we did, so we could block them out and move on with our lives. Further to this, we've recently just celebrated our first anniversary together, and we plan on buying our first home in the coming months. And shoutouts to our re-generals of the day, Portkis D. Ace, WR Curly 86, Shahar Byrne, and Julian Griffin. Become tomorrow's re-generals by leaving as many re's as you can in the comments below.